It's been a while since I've done any long-form programming, so let's write an operating system. What I'm going to do is attempt to port CPM to the 6002. This should be a pleasantly futile task because there is no CPM code that will actually run on a 6002 processor, so this should be interesting. CPM is a very old operating system from 1975. It was originally intended to run on 8080 systems, although it's been ported to a bunch of others, including, as you can see here, the 8086, the 68000, and the Z8000, which almost never, never saw light of day. It was originally intended to run on teletypes, and has only got, you know, basic support for things like real monitors. It's an absolute masterpiece of minimalism, and will provide a usable disk operating system with a easy to use command line on a machine with less than 64K. I think the smallest 8080 versions would run in 16, possibly less. Although realistically, you need the full 64K to do anything useful with it. I would like this in order to provide a reasonably portable operating system I can run on a variety of 6.02 machines. Uh, I've got some compiler stuff I want to do with it and trying to port the compiler to whatever half-assed operating system any given 8-bit machine is going to run is just a pain, particularly when you get to stuff like the Commodore 64 where the DOS is quite special in many ways such as not having the ability to seek within uh, ordinary files, which makes life awkward. However, the CPM file system is surprisingly advanced for the era. It supports uh, arbitrary fragmentation, files of up to, I believe, 32 megabytes, uh, sparse files where you can have holes that aren't allocated on disk, things like that and it's just generally better. The one thing it doesn't have is subdirectories, but luckily most of these systems didn't do subdirectories either. So, as I said, I wanted this for this, the Commodore 64, but I'm actually going to be targeting the BBC Micro first. The main reason is that I've got this rather nice emulator that com comes complete with a debugger uh, and the BBC Micro is a surprisingly advanced operating system for an 8-bit system, complete with pluggable operating systems. So you can see this one, we are running Virtual DFS, which is a pluggable file system that understands the emulator. So if I look at the directory, we see a single boot file. This is actually mapped to this host directory on the Linux system I'm doing the development on. Uh, so I can do star info boot, and we see we have a file called boot, which is readable and writable by owner, read only to others, load address 400, execute address 400, length 33 hex bytes, and uh, yeah, that's actually a symbolic link, but the actual file is here, and of course 33 hex is 51 bytes. So I can just write stuff to this directory and it will immediately show up in here. Let me try that. Like so, there is our new F file, which is empty. And over here, it has gone. So this will be, uh, not just this, but various other features will make this a much easier system to target for the main development than a real Commodore 64. We'll tackle this later, if and when. So the uh, CPM was originally designed for the 8080, and uh, was mostly then run on the subsequent Z80s that were backwards compatible with the 8080. 
And the 8080 and the 6502 are rather different beasts. So the uh, so we're going to have to make some changes to the way CPM works to make it run on a 6502 at all. So uh, let me make a few notes here. So the original 8080 memory map uh, at the bottom was zero where the vectors lived uh, and the top was FFFF of course which is a 16-bit system. When CPM was loaded the executable gets loaded at 0100. The CPM operating system itself sits up at the top of memory somewhere. Let's say 800. This can actually change. Uh, the BDOS is the operating system kernel. The BDOS is 3.5k, which is... E00. So immediately above the BDOS would come the BIOS, and the BIOS would occupy everything up to the top of memory. Just below the BIOS was a thing called the CCP, the command processor. That was 2K. Uh, so that would be loaded at 800. So your application goes from 0100 to D800 in this configuration. All these addresses are static. They are assigned when the system is built. Uh, you construct a CPM image that contains the command processor, the BDOS kernel, and the BIOS, which contains all the platform-specific stuff, all the way up to probably the top of memory. And you stick that on disk. And when the system starts, it simply loads all of this slot off disk into memory and then jumps to the BIOS start vector. And that is how CPM starts up. Uh, I will add that the TPA address here, 0100, it can change. However, CPM binaries are not relocatable. So uh, if you had a system that used a different address, you wouldn't be able to run binaries belonging to any other system. So no one ever did that. Now the 6502 works a bit differently. It's got a rather more complicated memory map. At the bottom, you've got a thing called zero page. At 0100, you've got the stack. These are at fixed addresses. 0200 is where the OS stuff starts. And typically, somewhere at the top of memory, uh, let's maybe about here, for example, we have the various I.O. ports. Zero page is special because the 6002 requires the use of uh, variables in zero page to get certain things done. And the zero page is much cheaper to access anyway. So, for example, the LDA instruction loads a value from memory into uh, the A register. So LDA address is three bytes, one for the instruction, two for the address. LDA 0P address is two bytes. There's a special form of LDA for doing this. And it's, I think, a couple of cycles faster as well. And there are things that you can only do in zero page, such as uh, uh, pointers, um, offset reads and writes. This then gets combined with the fact that the system that you have to run your stuff on typically allocates uh, things in fixed addresses and with which we have to work around. Because we want to run this in systems that were not designed for CPM. So, for example, on the Commodore 64, uh, screen memory starts 0400. Basic workspace starts here. This is where your program loads. Um, and if I remember correctly, C000 is where the basic ROM lives. 
but everything from there up can be remapped so you can replace it with RAM if you want but you're still stuck with your screen memory down here and your stack here and your zero page here on the BBC micro we've got zero page at the bottom the stack here the this is uh, defined by the CPU you can't move this uh, we then have OS stuff all the way up to 0400 language workspace all the way up to 0800 um, file system and other utility storage goes all the way up to on a stock BBC micro it's usually 1900 but this will this will change depending on uh, what ROMs you currently have installed and what file systems you're using. So this is typically known as page. You then have application workspace that goes up to, for example, 7C00, which is high mem. Video memory goes up to 8000, where the application ROM lives. C000 is where the kernel ROM lives. And this goes up to, I believe, F800, which is where the IO ports live. Uh, and then right at the very top of memory, at about EO, there is more ROM where your system call entry points live. The amount of video memory you've got will change depending whether you're in high resolution, low resolution, or text mode. So high mem can vary. It can go all the way down to 3000 and go all the way up to 8000 if you're using no video memory, which is possible on systems like the BBC Master where you can put the video memory in separate RAM. It doesn't live in the main address space. But for simplicity, we're targeting a stock BBC Micro. And in the, uh, in the Mode 7 text mode, the one we're going to be using for a lot of this, because it occupies almost no RAM, uh, high mem will be 7000. Page also will vary, depending on what file systems you've got. If you don't have a disk system, and you're just running off cassette, page is all the way down here. If you have a disk system, it'll typically be here. If you have a disk and network file system, it'll be here, which of course means that if you're in the highest resolution text, uh, highest resolution graphics mode, which occupies a whole 20k of video memory, you've got what 6k? Five and a quarter k of workspace, which isn't so hot. So clearly, if we want this thing to work on a system where our workspace starts 0800 and where our workspace starts at probably 1900, but this can vary a lot, we are going to have to make our entire system relocatable. Unlike CPM on the 8080, where everything loads a single address the uh, the CPM operating system itself can move, but is always at a fixed address on any given system. None of that is true on the BBC Micro. It's a little bit true on the Commodore 64. And then we get zero page. Because, of course, zero page is going to be used by both us, uh, that is, CPM, plus the application we want to run, plus the operating system, which will be sitting in the background most of the time. So yes, it's just more complicated. I have in fact defined a format for relocatable executables and done a simple tool that makes them. 
Oh, we're going to be using CC65 and LD65 to do all our assembly and linking. We create the relocatable files through the very old trick of assembling, well, linking our program three times at different addresses and then seeing what bytes have changed. Because we know that any byte that changes is going to be where an address is stored. Therefore, we store the location of the address in the relocation table and it gives us a really simple algorithm for doing relocations. We just add a, a constant value to all these bytes in the file after it loads and everything is fine. So how does CPM work? Well, I mentioned these three bits here. The uh, starting from the application view of things, the application makes DDoS calls to get stuff done. These are system calls into CPM that do various things. And this is a list of all the system calls. There aren't really very many. CPM is a very minimalist system. So we've got stuff like, you know, terminate program, uh, read and write a char from the console, read and write to the auxiliary port or the printer, uh, change device redirections. We're going to talk about these later. Uh, a few things like writing a string, although for some reason it uses a dollar sign as the string terminator, which isn't really very helpful. Uh, reading a line of text from the system with basic command line editing. And then we get on to the bulk of it, which is all of this, which is the file system interface because that is basically all that CPM gives you, a file system. You can open and close files, you can scan the directory, delete files, read and write sequential files. That is, you just keep reading records from the file until you reach the end and then it stops. Uh, create files, rename files, uh, some stuff to do with drive management. You can have up to 16 different drives on the system. Uh, this sets the address at which I.O. is done. This is not talking about hardware DMA. This is talking about uh, the address in the application workspace where records are read and written. Uh, some stuff to do with low-level drive things. You can make drives read-only so that uh, you can't accidentally write to them. Uh, there's some stuff to do with random access files. And you can tell by the way that these are all the way down here. Well, these are up here, but these got added later. This does a, uh, a seek into the file before for reading and writing any given record. And that's about it, really. So this is the stuff we're all going to have to implement. On the original CPM, this was all implemented in the BDOS, which is this module here. And this was distributed by Digital Research as a single relocatable binary blob. You could port CPM to your own system by uh, simply relocating this to a given address, saving it to disk, writing your own BIOS and everything worked. Uh, but of course, we're just going to, you know, write it in source code. The BDOS gets stuff done by calling into the BIOS. And the BIOS is the platform specific bit. And the BIOS has a smaller number of system calls doing things like uh, start the system up from scratch. This one is called whenever a program terminates and at which point the BIOS then reloads the CCP. We'll get onto the CCP later uh, and returns to the prompt. Console input output, printer input output, paper tape input output, and this gives you an idea of just how old CPM is. Uh, stuff to do with reading and writing sectors of disk uh, and a couple of extra things got added on the end. So in order to port CPM you basically just implement these 
uh, slap in the BDOS that you got from the digital research disk, slap in the CCP, create a file system, put the whole thing on disk, and then it'll work. Which brings us to the CCP. The CCP is the command processor. It is actually just a perfectly normal CPM application. It loads at a funny address. It's just underneath the BDOS rather than the normal uh, TPA address. TPA is transient program address. This is where programs get loaded off disk. Uh, the reason why it's up here is so the CCP can actually load a program down here without overwriting itself. It's nothing more complicated than that. Because, of course, the BDOS has no facilities for running programs. It's the CCP whose job it is to load a file off disk at 0100 and jump to it. That's how programs run. And the CCP provides the command prompt, the ability to load and run programs, and a small number of built-in commands, which include things like uh, arrays, rename, list the directory, uh, type a file to the console, uh, save just saves a arbitrary chunk of memory to disk, uh, user, which changes the current user number, which is a kind of Neolithic directory system that CPM has. We'll talk about that hopefully much later. And I think that might be it, actually. It might just be those six. And pressing Control C at the prompt. Uh, Control C is what you do whenever you change disks, and this causes the CCP to tell the BDOS that a disk is changed and it will reload things like the allocation bitmap. This is doesn't really have a name, but it is definitely a very important command. So, how are we going to do this? Well, I have a tiny stub program, which I came up with earlier, which is a BBC Micro executable, and we are going to turn this into a BIOS, and the BIOS is then going to load the BDOS, and the BDOS is going to load the CCP. This is not actually how 8080 CPM does it, but we have slightly different requirements. So let me show you the BBC Micro again. So the BBC Micro, as I said, has a fairly sophisticated operating system. You can have applications that run out of ROM, and we are currently running this one, BASIC. We can actually get the same information from inside the OS. So BASIC is a language ROM. Uh, language is the ACORN term for an application. You could get languages that weren't actually programming languages, like word processors. Uh, this is started up on reset and takes control of the system. During the reset process, this actually happens here. This, the, the banner basic here is telling you that the basic language is being invoked. And we can restart it like this, and you see we get the same banner. Uh, we don't actually care about BASIC at all, we're not going to be using it. But we are going to be writing a another application. This whole Our whole CPM port is going to run as an application under the ACORN operating system. So we want to be able to load CPM off disk, run it, and it will then take over uh, as the currently running application. Uh, we have the executable that I came up with. We can run this in two ways. We can either use the star run command, which just runs a machine code program, or just the name. So that's it running. It just prints two numbers and stops currently. Or uh, I just press the reset button known as break. Or we can do shift break, which is auto boot. And that will run the command called uh, exclamation mark boot instead of the current language. And you can see we have the same two numbers here. 
So the way the system is going to work is you stick the CPM disk in the drive of a BBC Micro, you do shift break, and it will boot and load, which is very straightforward. Uh, if we look at our memory map, again, notice that there is a specific block here of language workspace. This is 1K of space, uh, which uh, is at a fixed address. Unlike everything from page to high mem, the application always knows the absolute address of this stuff. So what we've done is we've made our executable load at that address so that we don't have to worry about relocating it. You know, the BBC Micro doesn't actually have features for relocation which makes writing machine code programs for it a bit irritating. Uh, and the uh, well, command. The Acorn file system stores the load address and execution address of files so that it knows that it's supposed to load at 400 and then start execution at 400. So what this is going to do, uh, well this is this program is going to contain all our I.O. code and it's just going to delegate to the uh, the operating system entry points. The operating system on the BBC Micro is known as MOS, M-O-S machine operating system which is a very original name and what this does is well we have a program uh, a routine here called print h8 that just prints a hex byte to the console anyone who's worked with the 6502 will recognize this code which is the standard way you do hex printing and then we jump to Osruch, which is the right character entry point. Um, and that is used by this code here, except for these four lines. And this calls one of the other system calls, Osbyte, to fetch the, let me fire that up, to fetch the low address of the transient workspace, which is 1900, prints it. Then we fetch the high address of the transient workspace, which is 7000, uh, 7C00, and we print that. So everything we do has to go within these bounds. And that is our starting point. But of course, this uh, this 1k of space isn't big enough to put the entire operating system in. So what we're actually going to do, let me clean this up rather, is we are going to put the BDOS here, the CCP here, and the TPA above it. So the TPA will span will span from the top of the CCP. Well, let me rephrase that slightly. So the TPA will span from the top of uh, not the CCP. Sorry, put that in the wrong place. The top of the BDOS all the way up to high mem. Yeah, uh, the CCP does not go between BDOS and the TPA. The CCP goes here, just under high mem. The reason for this is exactly the same reason why 8080 uh, CPM put the CCP up high. It's so that the CCP can load the application binary above the BDOS without overwriting itself. Now original CPM80, it loaded all this by just reading in a image of disk stored on the first few tracks of disk into memory. We are going to have to be cleverer than that because we don't know what address page is. So we are going to need to do a relocating load of disk of the BDOS. So we are going to need a relocation routine. Okay, this is the bit where 
uh, I stop talking about the stuff I've thought about in advance and start actually doing things. And the doing things involves we are going to have to decide on the system calls. Okay, I am going to be making some simplifying assumptions here. Uh, C uh, CPM supports uh, a bunch of devices. We've got the console, we've got the printer, which is write only, and we've got the paper tape input output. The paper tape is normally used as a serial port. Uh, the printer is normally attached to an actual printer because it's write only. However, the CPM support for these devices is kind of terrible. Like for the console, you can ask it whether a key is waiting. So you can poll the console to see if the user has pressed a key. Con in here will actually just block waiting for a, a key. There is a list status system call, clearly got added later, for testing whether the printer is ready to accept a byte. But there's nothing like that for the paper tape. So there's no way of knowing if the paper tape is ready uh, either to send a character or to receive a character. On systems that don't actually have paper tapes, which is nearly all of them, this was actually connected to the serial port. But without serial port status, then it's not really very useful. You can't wait on the serial port and the console at the same time. You can't write a serial terminal in CPM without doing direct hardware access. Plus, there is no facility here for doing anything like, you know, changing the serial board rate or uh, input output format and so on. So, n none of these are particularly useful. So, we are in fact just going to ignore these completely. Just take them out and not implement them. Um, I do have a plan for dealing with stuff like serial ports and printers involving loadable device drivers. We will do that much later, if at all. Another thing we can get rid of is sectran here. This was used to translate sectors. Uh, the idea is that uh, disk systems back then were very slow and you would read a sector of disk, think about it, and then try and read the next sector, but while you were thinking about it, the disk continued to rotate. So it's now too late to read the sector immediately after the first one on disk. And this was traditionally worked around by a thing called interleaving, where the sectors were not written in order on disk. So uh, you try to set the interleaving so that you read sector zero, you think about it, and then when you go back to the disk looking for sector one, sector one happens to be passing the disk head so you can read it immediately otherwise you have to wait for a complete disk revolution and there's only like five a second sectran was a way of doing this if your disk controller didn't support interleaving and it would translate the sector numbers in software and it was a complete pain because the sector tables were completely arbitrary and if you, was, you were presented with a CPM file system disk and you didn't know what translation mapping was being used, then uh, you were out of luck. You would just have to somehow guess to make the files make sense because even though the sectors on disk are labeled 0, 1, 2, 3, if CPM is translating these into 4, 9, 12, 0, then you don't know what's written where. We don't need that because all our modern systems do hardware interleaving, so we can get rid of that. So this gives us this set of system calls. We can also get rid of home. All home does is set track zero, sector zero. Waste of time. So this gives us these, which is reading and writing single sectors console input output, cold start and warm start. We're going to add two more. 
we're going to add relocate. We load a binary into memory. We call the relocate function. The relocate function patches the binary so that all the pointers inside the binary are pointing at the right address. Why is this here? You'd think this is common, not platform-specific code. This should be in the BDOS up here, which is correct, it should. But we want to use relocate for loading CPM proper. And if it's in the BDOS, we can't use it until the BDOS is loaded. So therefore, we can't load the BDOS. So uh, we are also going to use uh, get TPA. This is going to query for the workspace in which CPM lives, because this is going to vary from platform to platform and from configuration to configuration. And the equivalent one for zero page, because we don't know what bytes of zero page can be in use. For example, the BBC Micro uh, gives you everything in zero page from zero to eight F, I believe, for language use. However, the Commodore 64 reserves zero page addresses zero and one, I believe, for doing memory mapping. So clearly, we have to support both of these. So we have to relocate zero page as well. Uh, there will probably also need to be set versions for these. For example, after the BDOS is loaded, it will want to up update the TPA bound so it doesn't overwrite itself. Uh, do uh, We could either do this as more entry points. Yeah, let's just do it as more entry points. and like so. Okay, so we will, we've clearly got some variables. Let's go to our boot variables. So I have here some documentation, MOS API, there should be a thing on memory somewhere. Uh, no, that's somewhere else. That be in, yeah, I'll, I'll go find the memory map. Here we are. So this is the zero page allocation on the BBC Micro. So the language gets everything from zero to eight F. Uh, above that, there's like stuff all the way up to the top of zero page. Uh, and it describes what they all do. Page one has got the hardware stack. Uh, page two is MOS workspace vectors, etc. It goes all the way up to page four to seven, language workspace. That's the one K of space I described earlier. Sound workspace, buffers, more buffers, etc., uh, etc. Et and eventually we hit E00 which are allocated dynamically to sideways ROMs. These are application and service uh, modules. So 
uh, we are assuming that all our addresses are page aligned. Uh, do I want size or I'm going to use absolute values? Uh, we know up front because we're a language, we know we can access uh, everything from 0 to 8f, but we don't know what memory we're going to be using. So uh, let me see. So osbyte83 reads the low address, so that will be sty main base. Osbyte84 reads the high address, so that will be sty mem top. Okay, and it does not build because ca65 requires dollar signs. Okay, so there is our boot image, and we can run it, and it won't do anything. It will just hang. It's actually done it, uh, it's just it then does nothing. So now that we've figured out where the TPA is, we actually want to load the BDOS image. So we wish to load a file. Uh, this is a file of the MOS file system, not the CPM file system. So there is actually a system called, called OzFile, which is at FFDD. which uh, does simple file loads and saves. There is another API for doing uh, random access, which we're also going to be using. But for now, let's just load the BDOS. And the way this works is you point it at a control block. Uh, you give the address in the Y and X registers. The 6402 only has three registers and that describes what it's going to do. So let's make our control block. Um, so here's the layout. So we've got a pointer to the file name. This is going to be called BDOS. And this should end in a carriage return, if I remember correctly. Not a zero. Is there a... Doesn't actually say. Okay, followed by a 32-bit load address. Uh, followed by... Uh, I think the rest will get filled out when we do the load. If I have load file into memory, if the load, if the low byte of the oh of the execution address is zero, okay. So we do want to put the execution address in. Uh, 
start address I think also wants it to be wait oh, st wait, start address oh sorry I'm looking at the wrong column right this is at this is filled out with the length this block is used for both reads and writes. It's been about 30 years since I last used MOS for anything in particular. And another one for attributes. Also, why did I put these here? These go here. Not uh, one, two. So that's four bytes. Six, seven, eight, nine, A, another four bytes. A, B, C, D, E, four bytes. E, F, zero, one. Okay. So in order to load the BDOS, we actually want to take the base address and store it in uh, 0, 1, 2, 3. So we update the load address with where we actually want this thing to be loaded. We then call OS file with a function code of FF for load file. X wants to be the low address. Y wants to be the high address of the block and call. Right, on return, uh, right, load is the only call that generates an error. An error is a MOS thing, it's basically an exception. This will break to the system indicating that something's gone wrong. So we should be able to save that. Uh, 5 1. Uh, I'm just fixing my tabs. There we go. Okay, so that assembles. Here is our binary. Let's run it and see what happens. Okay. So it's tried to load the file called BDOS. It hasn't found it, so it, it's failed with an error. And because there is no language, uh, there is nothing to process the error, so it just Holds. If we go to basic and we run our program, we get dropped back to the basic prompt after the error. And not found is a dead confusing error message because uh, it looks like it hasn't found pling boot. So I think we should probably display a banner. Uh, to be so uh, this is going to uh, 
you give it the address of a string and it will print it to the screen. So this is a slight aside from what we were doing here, but we are actually going to have to do this. So now remember I was saying that pointers can only live in zero page. We're going to have to use our first zero page value. And these are incredibly precious. We're going to want to reuse this as much as possible. Uh, and in fact, because we have used that, we are going to need to update this. Uh, let's do the print thing first. So store the low byte into pointer plus zero. Put low byte of the address, the high byte of the address into pointer plus one. Begin a loop. Uh, LDY is zero, this is going to be our index. So we are going to load the byte at, uh, going to, we are going to add Y to the value of the pointer and load that. We are going to, if this is zero, exit. If it is a dollar sign, exit. Otherwise, write it increase y, jump back to loop. And is not a recognized control command. What is zero page stuff called? Zero page. Okay. Right, we need to adjust this. Well, it so happens that some of the stuff I did earlier Uh, zero page size is initialized to the initialized by the linker to be the size of your zero page area. So if we import, actually, I think end is more appropriate here. Is that going to work? I need to update the linker file. Uh, define equals yes here is the thing that causes the symbols to be created. Let's get the documentation. Oh, right, there isn't an end. I'm going to need load and size for this. So now if we look at our boot image, so down the bottom here, we've got our BDOS file name. We've got the control block for OS file. Uh, here is our file name. So here we have 0090 for the start and end of the zero page block. That wants to be one of those. That's better. Uh, we have using two bytes of zero page, so that starts with a two. Okay, let's make a banner.
So that will be low word of banner, high word of banner, print. Our banner is here. So we start BM. Right. So it prints the banner. In fact, there's no point putting the BBC micro bit because we know it's a BBC micro. It says so right up there. And also this is a BBC micro emulator. But you notice that uh, the 10 has caused a line feed, but not a carriage return. So we could get round that by putting a 13 here for a CRLF, but we're actually going to do it a different way, which is we're going to find a different entry point. We're going to use OzASCII. Uh, OzASCII, it, it just calls OzRuch, except if it's the... Uh, ooh. That's interesting. Um, I thought this was going to be OA, 10, that's line feed, but it's not, it's 13 carriage return. So we're going to have to implement this ourselves, which is a shame. Uh, let me think, actually. Actually, I think we don't want to do that. So what I was thinking was that we would translate 10 to, to translate a line feed to a carriage return and line feed. But actually, I think that's the BDOS's job, not the BIOS. And this is the BIOS. So let's just do that. OK. Anyway. Right. We have a banner, and it is trying to load the BDOS. So uh, we now can't get anywhere because there is no BDOS. So let us make one. So let's make a file for the BDOS. And add it to the make file. Okay, so that has created a BDOS, which is one byte long. We wish to put that in our BBC directory, which we're going to do using a symbolic link, like so. So now when we try and boot it, it has successfully loaded the BDOS and has then hung because we haven't told it to do anything. We are going places. Uh, the next thing that needs to happen is we need to relocate the BDOS. First thing is to store the pointer to the start. Um, we are going to need the pointer twice because we need to do two relocation passes, once for the zero page stuff and once for uh, the Uh, the actual ad the memory addresses so we could put it somewhere we've got quite a lot of scratch space we can use 
but instead I am just going to push stuff onto the stack. Okay. Um, actually, actually, we are going to need two pointers. So we need the pointer that pointer to the thing we're currently relocating and a pointer to into the relocation buffer. And we want to reuse these as much as possible. So if we look at our notes, actually, actually, we are going to stick some stuff in here. Uh, this header file contains all our CPM 65 things. So So the size of the zero page area is in the first byte and the offset in the file to the relocation table is in the word at address one. So we want to get this uh, We want to get this and add it to pointer one here. So so this is fetching the low byte of the offset. We want to add value here and store this in point two and do the same thing for the high byte so Pointer 2 is now pointing at the relocation table. Pointer 1 is pointing at the beginning of the binary. So now we are going to loop around processing all the zero page stuff. So the way this works is We get a relocation byte. If the byte is zero, we exit loop. If the byte is FF, then we want to uh, so the way the way this is going to work is that the relocation byte signifies the offset from the current relocation or the beginning of the file to the next one. So at this point, we actually want to add that to the relocation pointer. So that will be 
uh, add to pointer one plus zero branch of carry clear next ink pointer two uh, pointer one plus one. So this is, this will add an 8-bit value to uh, the address. Uh, this will use use up a so we are going to push and pop around it to preserve a so that we can then say is this OXFF? If it is, then don't actually do a relocate. Do a relocation. Instead, we wish to fetch the next byte and continue. Oh, uh, we can't actually jump here. Uh, just a quick aside, after reading the relocation byte, we actually want to advance pointer 2. Now, let's see, we've got the ins instruction set here. Where is increment 0 page? I'm just looking to see what flags are set by ink. And it does indeed set Z. So we can say increment the low byte if it is not zero we're done if it is zero then point to two then the low byte has just wrapped around and therefore we need to increment the high byte so this adds one to a 16-bit pointer So the thing is, here it would be very easy to say, was it FF? Oh, it was FF. Go back to the beginning of the loop. The problem is that if a relocation offset is exactly FF, then the next byte, then will this will be stored as an FF followed by a zero, at which point it will for it will hit this uh, and in fact that is not going to work anymore because we no longer have the Z flag set from here so we have to compare A against zero and then branch Yeah, we actually have I been a bit too clever here. So uh, each byte represents the interval between relocations. If uh, if the interval is too big to be represented as a byte, we're going to represent it as two bytes. That is an FF and then another relocation byte but zero is our terminator and we don't want to get it confused with FF followed by a zero so is there another way we can do termination I actually think there is uh, so let's make let's make FE our continuation and FF our terminator yes that will do fine it will occupy no extra space so I need to go and modify my modify this so if delta is greater than FE ok 
okay. And our terminator wants to be an FF, like so. Dollar sign. Dollar sign. Uh, pointer two is undefined. Okay. So here is our boot image, which is still pretty small. Uh, we do want to make our BDOS. We want to add a header to our BDOS followed by code that does nothing. Uh, these have to have dots on. Okay. So here is our BDOS, which contains a header. We are using no zero page bytes. Our relocation offset is nine. And then we have the two jump instructions that go in the header, followed by the relocation table, which consists of an empty zero page relocation table and a single offset of eight. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is this jump instruction here. So that will be uh, fixed up to be whatever page for the high byte and six as the low byte. But we actually want to do the fix up. So uh, pointer two, um, Pointer one is now pointing at the address to fix up. So, in fact, we haven't touched Y. Y can be zero for the entire lifetime of this loop. Uh, 642 indexes, you can only do pointer dereferences via Y. And you have to use register Y for this. With the 65CO2 they actually added a ver an instruction variant that didn't have the the Y register which is really useful. So get byte uh, add uh, this wants to be ZP base like so, and jump back to ZP loop. And then we'll want to do this again for the, uh, the memory relocations. In fact, this is all going to be exactly the same code except for this instruction here. Can we do better than this? We probably could. Yes, we can.
so this will relocate to zero page uh, we can then call it again we have to reset pointer one put that back to the beginning of the image but then we can call it again to do the memory stuff but we have to change this address here in fact we're not using the X register anywhere how do we add X well we kinda can't so we have to rearrange things so we put X into the A register and then we add the pointer like so can we get rid of this jump I think we don't, uh, we can't rather, as we have to, uh, we always have to go, we always have to do this first. We need to read the byte and increment the pointer before we do the comparison. Again, the 65CO2 has a bra instruction, which is a short jump. This is three bytes. Th that'll do. So so relocate the zero page now we want to reset pointer one because we stored all this stuff onto the stack so PLA STA uh, this this was x, which was the high byte, so this is going to be 0.1 plus 1, SDA 0.1 plus 0, LDX, membase, JSR, uh, JMP, relocate, loop. Okay, and that will do our relocation. So after loading the image, we want to relocate the image. The address is in AX, A is 0, X is mem base. So relocate. And we now want to jump to the BDOS. which is actually a little bit trickier than it looks because we don't want to jump to the beginning of it we want to jump to just a little bit in because it's uh it's an executable header in fact we are going to make a few slight changes So bare header is going to contain just the three bytes needed to relocate. Com header is going to contain what's needed for an actual com file, which will be the bare header followed by a jump to the BDOS. Uh, so I then need to edit this to be a com header and I need to edit this to be a bare header all right so here is our BDOS image which contains the three bytes of relocation of three bytes of header then a jump instruction for C0300 then the three bytes of relocation data
So we actually want to jump to the address plus three. Uh, where do we put the BIOS? Here. So the 6502 is actually a little bit short on indirect jumps. Uh, we, there are no indirect JSRs at all. There is a indirect, a single indirect jump. which takes a 16-bit address to a pointer. This is the only place where a pointer can be 16 bits, which is kind of weird. So... Oh, but of course, uh, because the BDOS is always loaded at a page boundary, then the entry point is going to be a nice fixed three. So that computes our start address, and then we call the BDOS. Now, this is actually going to be a new entry point which original CPM didn't have. Original CPM didn't actually initialize the BDOS at all from the BIOS. The BIOS would call the CCP, and the CCP would call the, the BDOS, but we're going to actually have to do something a bit more than that because we have to tell the BDOS where the BIOS entry point table is. which is going to be here. So, low address, high address, and jump. And the, uh, the BDOS is then going to call here to get stuff done. Uh, okay, let's see if this works. It assembles, which is a good start. Okay, so before we uh, actually do anything, let's pull up the debugger. The debugger is down here in this console window. So if I it's produced this window here, this window describes the memory use. So it's the, uh, 0 is the top here and uh, 64k is down here. So when I press the return key, you can see the blues are is code execution. So you're seeing the kernel in the bottom chunk here executing. Uh, and the basic language that's doing the prompt up here. The reason why this remains blue is interrupts and so on doing things. Uh, up here, red and green, this is the system workspace just idling. And the red streaks that you can see moving along here is writing to video memory. So if I switch to a high resolution mode, that big yellow slab was it clearing the video memory. So mode 0 is the biggest, 20k. Mode 7 is the smallest, 1k. We also have a mode 3, which is a bit smaller. It's only 16k. Um, and a mode 6, which I believe is 10k. We're staying with mode 7. OK, let's, let's break again. I'm going to set a breakpoint at 400. OK, and continue and boot. Alright, we've hit our breakpoint. We are here. 
So let me figure out how this works. These are all very slightly different. Uh, S is step, D is disassemble. So this is the machine code we've written. Here, 42B, this looks like the call to relocate. 42B, go. Okay. We should have loaded our BDOS binary and now we're about to go into relocation. Uh, our Hang on a second. Oh, that. Okay, here are our registers. Right. Uh, the pointer to the beginning of the binary is 1900. So let's go and see what happens. So we stash it into zero page in zero and one. Push onto the stack. Uh, Add on the relocation table offset. Okay, so that ain't right. So this is the memory dump. Here is our start pointer. This is supposed to be the relocation pointer and that's wrong. Should not be an FF, that should be something else. Here is our BDOS. Right, that is not what we were expecting. Okay, so. Reset this thing. So the BDOS, nine bytes. That ODFF is the is an empty basic program because we've just come from basic. So I think we failed to load the BDOS in the right place. So where's our OS file documentation? FF. Load a file into memory. If the low byte of the execution ah, if the low byte of the execution address is zero, the file is loaded at the correct load address. Otherwise it's loaded at its own load address. So these should be zeros. So we should just be able to do shift break and go again, continue. Okay, we now go into relocate step. Okay, we should have done a point of computation. Okay. That's better. If we dump at 1900, we can see here is our BDOS image, which is tiny. Uh, up here, we've got start address, relocation table. And 1906, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 
because the zero page relocation table is empty. Okay, so we load the zero page base into X four. And then we start the relocation loop. So we get the relocation byte into A, which is an FF. We add one to the pointer. Uh, it did not roll over, so we don't need to add to the upper byte. Was it an FF? It was. So we jump to 8D and return. Excellent. And if we look at our addresses, we can see that this has advanced to the next byte. This hasn't changed at all. So now we want to pull the, the old code pointer off the stack, which it won't change, like so. We load the memory based address into X, which is one nine, and relocate again. So get a relocation byte, which is a five this time, increment the pointer. Is it an FF? No, it's not. Save A. Add the relocation byte onto the pointer. Which we've done. We can now see that our pointer has not changed because we forgot to write the value back. Okay, so we're here. We have not advanced the pointer correctly. So this is going to fix up the wrong address. It's going to fix up the um, this initial zero. But let's go through it anyway to see if it works. Transfer X to A and store. Okay, and we can now see that this byte has been adjusted. Jump back to the top of the loop, load a byte, increment the pointer. It was an FF, so we return. Okay, so 42E is the end of the uh, relocation. So let's go again. Great, or to e, continue, continue. Okay, we should have now finished our relocation, hopefully correctly. Yes, here is the address, uh, 1903. So we are here. So we compute the address. Actually, we can do better than that. Uh, the other way to do indirect jumps is by pushing onto the stack and using RTS, and that is actually marginally smaller. I just need to remember what order to push. Uh, high byte second. So they're going to do LDA3, LDA membase, and push RTS. Okay. Right, 
42E, push the address onto the stack, load membase, push that onto the stack, load the BIOS address, and return to the wrong address. Let's try that in the other order. Push, push, load, RTS. Right, we are now at 1904, which is also the wrong address. because RTS has got an implicit add one. So let's do that again. Push, push, load, load, RTS. And we are in our BDOS at the right address with a fixed up binary and we are doing our infinite loop. That's good, that is working. Okay. So we have a relocation routine. We have loaded the BDOS. We have the basics of a BIOS. Uh, next, I believe that I want to define storage for the BIOS, uh, the BIOS entry point. So that's going to be the low address, high address. So let's go this again. Uh, can we delete? Do I delete breakpoints? Be clear. Be clear zero. Be clear zero. Be clear one. Okay, break at one nine oh three. Continue. We're at one nine oh three. We are storing these values. D and then we go on to our infinite loop. That actually all looks like it's working, which is nice. Okay, so we have a here's our BIOS. Uh, we are we have a way for the BDOS to call to the BIOS to get stuff done. However, however, so the way the way CPM80 does BDOS calls is you pass the parameters in two registers, 8-bit registers, and a function number in a third. That's fine on the 6402. We've got three registers. We can do this. The way it does BIOS calls is it just calls the address of the routine. And there's a jump table at the beginning of the BIOS that just has a series of jump instructions in order. It can do this because the BDOS is linked to the BIOS. It knows where all the, uh, it knows where the jump table is. So it can just call them directly. We can't do that here. And the 6502 makes this kind of thing a little tricky. So if we had a jump table, let's try and call the first thing. We could, let's, let's call the second entry in the jump table. We could do LDY2. 
LTA files y pj and y LTA files y pH RTS. Uh, this will then push the low byte, then the high byte. I bet that's the wrong way around. It is the wrong way around. Uh, so it needs to be the high byte, then the low byte. Uh, the other way we could do it is to uh, so this will this will require a table that looks like this. The other way we can do it is to split the low and high bytes. No, that, uh, sorry, that, that's a common way of doing jump tables, but I don't think I can be bothered. I don't think it makes a difference. Uh, the other thing is that it requires us to put the BIOS pointer into zero page. I think instead we actually want function numbers so that you would actually could do LDY3, LDY is the function number, uh, jump, well, this should be JSR BIOS, but uh, as there isn't a JSR BIOS, this would be a uh, something like this. So that pushes the return value onto the stack, calls this, and that does the jump. And then it becomes the BIOS's job to do something with this number. What have we got in the way of indirections? Uh, there's not a lot actually. There's this one. This allows you to indirect into a table, or a table of pointers. The problem is that the table has to be in zero page. And we don't want to do that as it's waste zero page. Yeah, you can do the same thing with these. This. Uh, adds Y on to the 16-bit address after it's loaded from zero page. That's what we're using here. Of course, the other thing we could do is just do this. Uh, this uses self-modifying code to push the BIOS address into the jump instruction. It is two bytes shorter than putting a variable here. Yeah, let's do it like that. So... Where is our list of entry points? Uh, this will be zero, one, two, three, four, con out. Let's actually put these in the in here. Yes, 
this allows this will actually allow us to do much faster BIOS calls. So let us print a character from our nascent BDOS. So this wants to be BIOS con out. The character wants to be a Q. And we call the BIOS. And we spin. So we now need to change the BIOS itself. So this is actually going to be a function now. Parameter is in XA, function in Y. So what we want to do here is to jump to uh, its user jump table. There are no index jumps. So we save XA so we can do arithmetic. don't need to save X, we just need to save A. All right, so this should be our dispatch function. So this is using a split jump table, and this is a trick that 6 of 2s used for a while. If we were to just use a set of entry points like this, then each entry is two bytes apart. We would need to double Y, uh, load the low byte, increment Y, load the high byte. However, if we split them by doing this, put all the low bytes, and then we put all the high bytes, then this means that no arithmetic is required and everything gets much easier. And that is what we are going to do. So here is our list of system calls. That's going to go here. And 
this is going to be the high bytes. And if you've noticed, we have already implemented this. Also, I now remember that our printf here uh, is this is in the BIOS, not the BDOS, so there's no point having the test for the dollar sign. Now this will not link because we're missing so many entry points. So we will implement stubs for these entry points. Don't need relocate. Okay, so that builds. Uh, we're going to implement con out. Actually, for con out, so I picked these registers carefully. Uh, the the low byte of the parameter is in A, and the high byte is in X. So we can actually just point con out at Osruch, and that will just work because Osroch has the right uh, signature. And for con in, uh, we want Osroch. A is the byte red, okay. And we need to implement Oswood. FFE0. OK. So now if we run our program and continue, uh, that did not work. Okay, let's, why did that not work? So we are writing to the jump instruction here. Low, high. So if I now disassemble, we can see 1913 here has got a jump into the BIOS. So we are at 1909 here. So uh, con out is the function in y. A is the parameter JSR1913, JMP043A. We're now in the BDOS. Uh, sorry, we're now in the BIOS. We're here. So push a. Let's look at the registers. Function number four. X is garbage. A is the byte. So load the low byte of the function table. Stash. Load the high byte of the function table. Stash. Ha! Ah. Continue, and there is our queue. Okay, we have made our first BIOS entry point call. How big is our BIOS. We should do some renaming. T. 
263 bytes, so we we're a quarter full. Most of that's the relocation code, and our BDOS is trivial. All right, I think that's a good skeleton. So I think I will commit things and come back next time. Next time we will implement uh, we will implement next time we probably should start work on the file system. I mean all there is is file system to be honest. Yes, I think that's going all right. So commit. And done. 